Good morning, my fellow scientists. It is Thursday, June 29th, 2017. I want to give you a quick version of the talk I gave at the ACS conference on our recently published paper where we allowed a DNA nanomachine to escape one type of particle and be captured by a second type of particle and produce a fluorescence response that we could read. I like to think of it as a sort of biomimetic analogy for cell-cell communication, because I think that the future of making biology more quantitative and making the really hard parts of cancer and development and neurobiological injury are all going to be in cell-cell communication and making that more visible than it is now. So how do I hope to do that? So if you're so if you remember from your high school biology, the DNA structure looks like this, where we have this beautiful double helix, and that's made of two strands that are held together by the hydrogen bonds between the purines and the pyrimidines. That is to say, adenosine binds thymidine, A binds T, and guanine binds cytosine, G binds C. What you may not know is that DNA is also a synthetic molecule. We can make DNA from scratch, from the tiny component bits, the bases. We can make a whole piece of DNA that doesn't have anything to do with biology. It's just a chemical. So it's not a gene. It doesn't encode for anything. You just put the A's, the T's, to G's and C's in order, and you get a chunk of DNA. When it comes off of the synthesizer, the synthetic DNA is single-stranded. It's like half the double helix, not the whole thing. And I like to abbreviate that by looking at first just the letter code. So it goes from the five prime end over here, which we abbreviate here, to the three prime end down here. And this ACTG becomes just a few letters. And then we can take that letter sequence, ACTG, and call that sequence number one, or give it a number and just abbreviate it as a ball, an arrow diagram there. So with that kind of nomenclature, we can then say, let's take strand identifier two, domain two, and mix it up with two star, which is the reverse complement. And when those two find each other, they hybridize to make the full double-stranded duplex down here. So starting from nothing but synthetic molecules, we can create this simple hybridization reaction that produces a double-stranded DNA that's kind of like natural DNA, but doesn't correspond to any biological sequence. We can use that to do some interesting things like detection. So if you have synthetic DNA, you can add synthetic chemistry to it. For instance, you can add a fluorescent molecule and a quencher. And when those two are together, they're dark. When they come apart, they become a bright green fluorescent glowing compound. And you can induce that fluorescence response by adding what's called a displacer. So this three star can bind to this three toe hold and the two star can then kick out this two star to create the fluorescent molecule leaving behind this little waste strand. So it's all just DNA hybridization. You go from single strand to double strand and you can make this reaction. And we've done some pretty crazy things with that like put it on the surface of particles. I don't need to get into the details. The gist of it is you can make polymer plastic particles that contain this DNA using some modified chemistry and some polymerization reactions. We even built our own equipment to do that. And the result is all these little plastic particles with DNA on their surfaces. We can also put the DNA in the, in the middle of the particle if we want. So this green color is green fluorescent DNA that's stuck to the surface of these particles. It's all synthetic. There's no biology involved. These aren't cells. They're just plastic particles coated with DNA we invented from scratch. And if we want, we can use those fluorogenic reactions, those reactions that produce fluorescence, to look at reactions on the surface of these particles. So when one DNA molecule comes in, this analyte, it kicks out this quencher and produces this active red fluorophore that looks like this, where before there was no red fluorescence, afterward there's bright red fluorescence. So we can do this in multiple colors. We can include green or blue fluorescent molecules in the middle of these particles and then put the red fluorescent DNA on the outside. 
And if we do this, we can actually make multiple different kinds of these detectors. So these particles are able to detect three different species of DNA. Each species of DNA has a different colored particle that lights up in the red when it finds its target. So we use a pretty complicated DNA reaction network to make all this happen, but the gist of it is the same thing. We have some green particles that are going to receive a message and some blue particles that are going to send out a message. When we initiate this whole reaction, you can see that the blue particles light up because they've sent the message, and some of the green particles, the ones that are in the right environment and have the right conditions, they light up in the red as well because they've received that chemical message from their neighbors. If you don't have the release, the green particles stay quiet. They don't light up in the red. So what we have here is a situation where these blue particles right here released a whole bunch of DNA, and these green particles actually responded to that, sort of like cells responding to the messages of their neighbors. And to me, that's just really fun and exciting. So I hope you find that kind of thing interesting. Tune in tomorrow. We update Monday through Friday. We talk about chemistry and biochemistry and analytical chemistry and science in general, the kind of things that make me happy here in the Allen Lab.